enzymes. So enzymes are organic catalysts. That means that they speed up the rate of reactions within organisms. Now, did you know that in the presence of an enzyme, a particular reaction can occur within a range of 1,000 up to 1 billion times faster than without an enzyme? How remarkable is that? Now, if you find this intriguing, then stay tuned to the end of the lesson where we will be discussing factors that affect enzyme-controlled reactions. So let's dive in. So when we talk about factors that affect reactions controlled by enzymes, we simply refer to factors that affect enzymes either directly or indirectly, which will in turn affect the reactions they catalyze. Now, our first factor is temperature. Now, temperature affects enzymes because enzymes are made from proteins. Now, anything that consists of proteins will be affected by changes in temperature. So what happens is that at low temperatures, the enzymes are inactive. They are dormant. They're just there. You know, they're not up to their normal functioning. So as you can imagine, the rate of the reaction is also going to be slow. If you increase the temperature, the enzymes now become active and therefore the rate of reaction increases. Now, this continues until you hit the optimum temperature. So, the optimum temperature is the best temperature at which enzymes function, the best. So, this is usually within the range of 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. So, in this temperature, you're going to have enzymes being most active and the rate of reaction being its highest. Now, if you will continue to increase the temperature, what will happen is that if you increase it above 40 degrees Celsius, it will end up destroying the enzymes. So high temperatures above 40 destroy the structure of an enzyme. This process is referred to as denaturing. So at this temperature and above, enzymes will be denatured. Now the structure of an enzyme is very important to its functioning. If you haven't watched my previous video where I discuss characteristics of enzymes, be sure to check it out because it explains this in details. So the structure of an enzyme is very important to its functioning. Now this is because enzymes have a particular part of the, the structure called the active site. At this point is where the enzyme binds onto the substrate, allowing it to catalyze the reaction. So if you increase temperatures above 40, what essentially happens is that the structure, the active site is destroyed. And the active site needs to have a particular structure in order to bind to the substrate. So if you destroy the active site, you're essentially causing the enzyme to stop functioning. So very high temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius destroy the structure of an enzyme, therefore preventing it from functioning. This is known as denatured. Moving on to the next factor, pH. Now, what is pH? pH is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity of a substance. Is a substance acidic? Is it basic? Is it neutral? Now, when it comes to enzymes, enzymes are specific in their pH. Some prefer an acidic pH, others prefer an alkaline one, but most enzymes usually prefer a neutral pH. So this simply means that if you have an enzyme whose optimum pH is acidic, they function best in an acidic pH. Now, a good example of this are the enzymes that are present within our stomach. In our stomach, hydrochloric acid is secreted. As you can imagine, hydrochloric acid is going to make the stomach pH acidic. Now, enzymes that function in the stomach, such as pepsin, usually prefer an acidic pH. So, they work best in an acidic pH. Their optimum pH is acidic. Now, what will happen if you were to change this pH to a basic one? Yes. As you can guess, it, the enzyme is going to be denatured. So the enzyme is going to be destroyed. Therefore, you can imagine it can no longer function. What will happen to the rate of the reaction? It will slow down and stop. What am I saying? What am I saying? I'm simply stating that enzymes prefer a specific pH, optimum pH. And enzymes are specific. Some prefer an uh, a neutral pH, while others prefer an acidic or alkaline pH. So extreme changes in the pH will cause the enzyme to become denatured, and therefore the rate of the reaction will slow down. Moving on to the next factor, substrate concentration and enzyme concentration. Now these two factors are tied. They go hand in hand. So let me give an example. Let's imagine in this case, we are having enzyme maltase and the substrate in this case is maltose. Now at the beginning, 
the enzyme concentration is high. We are having a lot of enzymes, but the substrate concentration is low. So in the beginning, the rate of the reaction is going to be very fast because you have more enzymes, you have less substrate. So catalyzing of the substrate will occur very quickly. But it's going to reach a point whereby the reaction will slow down and eventually stop. And the reason for this is because all the substrate molecules would have been catalyzed by the enzymes. So what can you do to increase the rate of the reaction at this point? increasing the substrate molecules so if you want to increase the substrate concentration again the rate of the reaction will speed up what if it was the reverse what if you had a high substrate concentration and a low enzyme concentration so initially the rate of the reaction will increase but it's going to reach a point whereby it will slow down and the reason for this is because all the active sites of the enzymes are going to be occupied by substrate. So you're going to have a long queue of substrate molecules awaiting their turn at the active site. So the rate of the reaction will slow down. How can you increase the reaction at this point? Simple. By increasing the concentration of the enzyme. Next one, inhibitors. So inhibitors from the term inhibit are substances that prevent enzyme from performing their function. They interfere with the functioning of enzymes. Now when it comes to inhibitors, there are actually two types. We have competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. Now let's start with the competitive inhibitors. Now these are substances whose shape, whose structure is similar to that of the substrate. So let me just remind you a bit, when it comes to this enzyme and the substrate, they need to have a particular structure that allows them to fit with one another and therefore allowing the enzyme to catalyze the reaction. So in short, it's like a lock and key mechanism. A certain key will only fit in a particular lock and so on. So the substrate molecule has to have a particular shape in order to fit into the active site of the enzyme. Now in the case of the competitive inhibitors, they have a similar shape to that of the substrate molecules. So as you can imagine, competition sets in. So they compete with the substrate molecules for the active site of the enzymes. So they take up the active sites of the enzymes, remain attached to the enzymes. What will happen? Of course, the enzymes can now not catalyze the reaction, uh, catalyze the substrate. The good thing about this is that this is usually temporary. It's not a permanent effect. So how can you remove the non-competitive inhibitors or its effect? By increasing the substrate concentration or simply decreasing the concentration of the inhibitor. Moving on to the last one, the non-competitive inhibitors. Now these are the gangsters of the inhibitors. They don't care whether their shape is similar to that of the substrate or they are taking over that active site, whether you want it or not. So in the case of the non-competitive inhibitors, they don't have a structure similar to the competitive to the substrate molecules. What they do is that they bind onto the enzyme. Sometimes they don't even do it onto the active site of the enzyme. So they bind onto the site, uh, onto the enzyme, and this of course prevents the enzyme from catalyzing the uh, the substrate. Now, by doing so, what happens is that when they bind onto the enzyme, they sometimes even change the shape of the enzyme. Can you imagine? This is on another gangster level. They don't need to have a similar shape to the substrate molecules. And when they bind themselves onto enzymes, they end up changing the structure of the enzymes. So that means in future, the enzyme can no longer bind to the substrate molecules, whether the inhibitor is present or not. Now, as you can imagine, such inhibitors are fatal. You know, they are very deadly. Just imagine taking over enzymes and preventing them from catalyzing any future reactions. Now, I'm going to give an example of a non-competitive inhibitor, cyanide. Now, you might not know cyanide, but I know you've seen it in movies or such. Have you ever seen those old movies? You know, not old, but okay. Whereby you have a spy, someone who gathers information for either an organization or a government being captured and then the spy does this you know, and then suddenly he or she starts foaming on the mouth and dies. Now in the past, what happened is that some spies used to have cyanide capsules inserted onto a fake tooth in their mouth. So when they are captured in order to prevent interrogation, of course, leaking of secrets, what happens is that they split open the capsule, releasing cyanide into their body. 
Now, cyanide is a non-competitive inhibitor. It interferes with respiration and therefore interferes with production of energy, ATP. So in short, you'll find that in your body, in the presence of cyanide, all the processes that rely on energy simply stop. What happens to you as an organism? You follow. See you next time.